Good morning, and thank you for attending the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing today on freedom of religion or belief in Syria. Thank you also to our distinguished witnesses for joining us. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, is an independent bipartisan U.S. government advisory body created by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, or IRFA. The commission uses international standards to monitor freedom of religion or belief abroad and makes policy recommendations to the U.S. government. Today, USERF exercises its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this virtual hearing. Today's hearing will delve into Syria's continuing political conflicts and humanitarian crises through the lens of international religious freedom in order to both better understand current conditions and to consider how U.S. policy towards Syria can more effectively integrate religious freedom concerns. Our panelists today will identify the civil war's effect on a range of religious and ethnic groups throughout Syria and evaluate the role of various actors inside and outside Syria in restricting or facilitating freedom of religion or belief. Finally, witnesses will discuss potential opportunities for US policy to support Syria's diverse religious and ethnic communities. How can religious freedom be a part of a political solution for Syria? This past March, 2022 marked the 11th consecutive year of the Syrian crisis, one of the world's longest and most destructive political conflicts. A range of actors have committed egregious violations of religious freedom or belief against a wide variety of religious and ethnic groups. In addition to President Bashar al-Assad's vicious re repression of Sunni Muslim opposition groups and ruthless disregard for the well-being of religious minority communities, his regime claims to protect Armed opposition forces and militant Islamist groups continue to target vulnerable religious and ethnic minorities in their attempts to wrest power from the regime and from one another. The Al-Qaeda offshoot Tayat Tahrir al-Sham, or HTS, the dominant governing and religious force in the northwestern region of Idlib, brutalizes minority communities, restricting the freedom of worship in Idlib's indigenous Christians and displacing them by seizing their properties and churches. Another consistent violator of freedom of religion or belief is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. Although ISIS does not currently control territory, in recent months, it has increased its presence in areas such as Deir Zor in eastern Syria, waging almost daily attacks on the US-allied Syrian Democratic Forces, or the SDF, in the Northeast that have fought to make the region stable for religious minorities and other endangered populations. Yusuf's May 2020 hearing, Safeguarding Religious Freedom in Northeast Syria, explored conditions exclusively affecting freedom of religion or belief in the north and east regions of the country. Witnesses at today's hearings will provide an update on religious freedom conditions across the country, as well as in the same area, including the uniquely religious pluralistic and tolerant environment fostered by the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, or AANES. Following several years of efforts to better reflect the religious and ethnic diversity of Northeast Syria, the AANES has come to include diverse members from a variety of backgrounds, such as Kurd, Arab, Circassian, and Turkmen of Sunni Muslims and other religious identities, Yazidis, Syriac Assyrians, Armenians, and other Christians. The Autonomous Administration allows religious conversion, including from Islam to Christianity, and openly promotes cross-religious civic efforts in stark contrast to the violent intolerance of nearby Turkish-backed Islamist militias, or TSOs, in the Turkish-occupied areas. I will now give the floor to USERF Commissioner Sharon Kleinbaum. Thank you very much, Chair Menza. I join the chair in welcoming you all to today's hearing. As Chair Menza outlined, the Assad regime has played a significant role in creating, maintaining, and escalating conditions inhospitable to freedom of religion or belief in Syria. Syria has a rich heritage of diverse religious and ethnic groups. However, the Assad regime has trampled on and exploited that diversity for its own corrupt and violent ends. The civil war began in 2011 when a peaceful grassroots uprising calling for greater freedom triggered a ferocious crackdown by the government with the support of its military and international allies such as Russia, Iran, and the Lebanese Hezbollah. Today, the Assad regime, aided by those partnerships, has regained control of approximately 70% of Syria. It has done so with heinous methods such as deploying chemical weapons and targeting civilian infrastructure. Indeed, the same regime that has styled itself as a protector of religious minorities has demolished religious minorities' houses of worship during clashes with opposition groups in contested areas. 
Meanwhile, in the, area, in the areas it controls, the administration has marginalized and vilified members of the Sunni Muslim majority in relation to Assad's own Al-Wali branch of Islam, redistributing Sunni religious authority to government ministries and disingenuously characterizing most Sunni Muslims as violent extremists who threaten both religious minorities and the modernism of the state. Likewise, Assad and his Ba'athist cronies continue to strip religious minorities of their autonomy. For example, <clears throat> formally classifying Yazidis as a sect within Islam, forcing them under legal and religious jurisdiction of a religion to which they do not subscribe. While Turkey has crucially hosted millions of Syrians displaced by the regime's violence, it also wields significant influence on the Istanbul-based opposition and has increasingly contributed to religious and ethnic repression in Northern Syria. Its direct occupation and military operations in that area have devastated at-risk religious, religious minority communities such as the Christian majority town of Tel Tamer. Its actions around Afrin have included forcibly purging the local Kurdish, Yazidi, and Syriac Assyrian Christian populations, replacing them with Sunni Arabs displaced from other parts of Syria and refugee camps in Turkey. Further, its armed proxies, Islamist Syrian militias, sometimes called Turkish supported opposition groups or TSOs, pose an additional grave threat to religious freedom. TSOs, such as factions of the Syrian National Army, SNA, formerly known as the Free Syria Arm, Syrian Army, FSA, wage campaigns of religious and ethnic cleansing, terrorizing Yazidis and Kurds with shelling and targeting these communities, women and girls, for kidnapping, sex trafficking, and lethal torture. As long as Turkish-backed based Syrian opposition groups ignore or trample religious freedom in the areas they hold, there is no real chance for religious minorities or any civilian communities to find peace and stability, much less to thrive and prosper. In addition to a discussion of the role of non-state actors and, and regional powers, especially Turkey, in committing these religious freedom violations in Syria, today's hearing will explore the Assad regime's numerous blows to freedom of religion or belief in areas of the country under its control, as well as in contested regions in which it has attempted to crush its opponents. We will hear from expert witnesses who will document the many ways in which the Assad regime has violated, exploited, and immeasurably damaged the essential rights of the Sunni Muslim majority, numerous religious minorities, and the very religious diversity and coexistence that once characterized <clears throat> Syria prior to the present conflict. I now turn the floor back to Chair Menza to introduce our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kleinbaum. Our hearing today begins with special remarks from Ethan Goldrich, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs at the United States Department of State. Um, DAS Goldrich is responsible for Levant and Syria engagement, and his remarks today will address U.S. policy for Syria. Hello, everyone. My name is Ethan Goldrich, and I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs with responsibility for Syria and the Levant. I would like to begin by thanking the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom for allowing me the opportunity to share our views today about religious freedom in Syria. As you know from our human rights reporting, and your own, the state of human rights in Syria is abysmal, including with respect to freedom of religion or belief. We are grateful to the Commission for organizing today's hearing to review the situation. We greatly appreciate the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom's reporting and recommendations on promoting respect for freedom of religion or belief, as well as the special reports it produces on individual countries. The administration has made it a priority to promote accountability and justice for the ongoing atrocities committed in Syria, including against members of religious and ethnic minority groups and regardless of the perpetrator. Promoting universal respect for religious freedom is a key U.S. foreign policy priority. We continue to strongly support efforts to realize an inclusive Syrian society that includes rights for members of all religious and ethnic minority groups. Such efforts are necessary to secure a lasting and stable peace 
and support the political process outlined in UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Unfortunately, there are reports in Syria that members of religious and ethnic minority groups have been unjustly detained, tortured, forcibly disappeared, and killed by the Assad regime. They have been subjected to abductions, killings, and other abuses and atrocities at the hands of ISIS, and reportedly victimized by other non-state armed groups that have desecrated religious shrines. Our efforts are aimed at ending abuses by all parties, preventing future ones from occurring, and promoting accountability for those responsible. The Department of State continues to actively engage the UN Special Envoy for Syria, our partners and allies, members of the opposition, and Syrian civil society and international organizations to support and advance UN-facilitated Syrian-led efforts in pursuit of a political solution to the conflict that would safeguard human rights, including the right to freedom of religion or belief of all citizens. These efforts include the UN Constitutional Committee process, although we have been consistently disappointed by the failure of the regime to engage in a meaningful way. We strongly believe that stability in Syria can only be achieved through a political process that represents the will of all Syrians. I also want to make clear that the United States will not normalize relations with the Assad regime, lift sanctions on Syria, or change our position opposing reconstruction in Syria until there is irreversible progress toward a political solution. We look forward to working with you all to continue to promote respect for human rights, including freedom of religion or belief, as well as to call for the accountability that is essential to securing a stable, just, and enduring peace in Syria. Thank you very much. And now we will hear from two panel of witnesses. Panel one is comprised of members of the Syrian political bodies in opposition to the Assad regime. The Syrian Opposition Coalition is led by Sheikh Salem al mazlet president, who is un unable to join us today. The Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, or AANES, is the governing body in the parts of North and East Syria. Mr. Bajanji Kurd of the AANES recorded his testimony from Syria in a vi video interview with me, excerpts which will now follow. A transcript of the full interview is available on the USERF website on the page for today's hearing. Um, and we will also have the testimonies that will follow as well. We are glad to have Badran Gia Kurd, Deputy Co-Chair of the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, or AANES, join us today. As USERF has reported for several years now, the Autonomous Administration has fostered an environment of religious freedom and ethno-religious pluralism that is unique in both the Syrian context and across the region. Badran, welcome. Spastikum as is we va kedewa u hardana u habate wal ser harimama am galak ki khoshun u am spastiyawadik. To begin, could you describe the autonomous administration's vision for religious freedom and mutual respect among different religious and ethnic communities in Northeast Syria? How does this vision stand in contrast both to the Assad's regime's use of sectarianism and to the future objectives of other segments of Syrian opposition? راستی دسپیکا چگونه ریبیا خسر یا لهری من می با کروشلات سوری جبوی خوا مبدا پرستنا اورو باوریان اساس گرد جبوی که هر کسک دباوری خدا آزاد به و درباره دا گله که اجراات ریبیا خسر هبون هر واحه بیرنگی در پیمان جواکی در ریبیبیا خسر گروپ اولی چاندی دکانن باوری اخوای اولی به پاریزن برگی چیکرنا تنظیم و سازین خوا جاردی ریبیبیا خسر مده آجیان بش یعنی جرد بجن تعایش مشترک او اصاس گرد و لسر و نخو آباکر که ببری که به مبدعی که هیچ دره بکر که همو پیکاتی همو اول و باوری همو چند با آشتیانه لگل هفته و بکر جان بکن 
جبر کو هریم باکور جلاد سوریه نموزه جه که بچو که جه سوریه تبا لورا ده باکور جلاد سوریه گلک اول مسلمان ایزیدی مسیحی علوی شیشان گلک گروپ باوری و ثقافی و اتنیکی جدا جدا هنه لورا ربابی خسر به هشمندی آخوا به فکر و باوری آخوا دکاری کو جبوی با اولا و با گروپانا حمو ها به سیستم اکی کو به هفت را حمو با آشتی جان بکن تجاری ریبابی خسر فرق و جدایی نخست نابر کسان جبر اولی وی جبر باوری آوی کو یا اب مسلمان یا اب خرستیان یا اب ایزیدیه کو دوی ممیزات هر کسی اب یان اب تو فرق و جداتی نخسته نابره واندا بچوک مزن او گروپ دوی هبون خواه بپاریزن رنگ خواه بپاریزن جبر و ریبابلی دری خوابه کر گود کو پیویست حمو اول حمو باوری دنا و ریبابلی و سازین ریبابلی دا جی خواه بگرن نها بی کو تو گروپ و تو اول بین اقصا کرن لدر و بین ایشتن نا حمو تمثیل اوان دا حمو مجلس و دستاین ریبابلی و سازی و دستگه ها دا جی دگرن بشکل که وک هب به کفر کوچیتی هب مثلا بیرو آفیسا ای کاروبارن اولاه هی سرک وی مسلمانه جگر وی یک خرستیانه جگر وی دیتر یک ازیدیه به وی شکلی دحمو سازیان ربابی خسر دا جی دگرن به شکل ک عادی و که کو حرکت زنده ده هزار و پانزده شون با مگر که هریم ج رخست نه تند و دانش رزگار کرد من بهش تبقا رقا درزور او لپی رزگار کرد مباشرتا لوی در مجلس مدنی هرمی چه بونج خلق هرمی به بی آوائی دوا هرما دا و که کو ادی ری و مجال و بوج بی کو هر کس باوری آخه بپاریزه هدی مجال و بو کو هر کسی جدس تند رویا دانش رویایی و که خرستیان ازیدی شیشان کرد یک کو جدس دانش رویا بون پشتی رزگار کرنه گل کس و گریان جنوب ایدی بیرو باوری خواهد هره مخواهی اصلی دا مشاندن و هر وها بو فرصت که گرین دا و هره ما دا مساحت که باش چه بو جبو کو سازین مدنی سازین جن ای حقوقی کو کارو خبات خواه بکن و که کوهی دی هشمندیه که تسامح دینی و آزادی اول و باوری به شکل که باش پیش کت دوا هری مادا راست گوارتن که گرین دوا هری من رزگار کریدا چه بو لی فقط حرتش تمام نبو یعنی هینا کار و خبات ما دوام ده که لتبای باکر و رجلات سوریه ده هری من ربه بیا خسر ده تا که ام بکان بن مبدا و پیوان اصاسی یک و ام به باور جبوی آزادی اولا و باوریان ام وینا گاب گاب دخوازن کور بکن دنا با جباکا خواده پیش را ببن براستی جبر کو گروپ تندره وکا داعش حتی گروپ اسلامی یکو نها دبن نابی اپوشن ده تینا ناس کرن و چه رژیم سوریه دبه اما سیاست من به خراب لسر جواکا سوریه پیش خستن که هیشتن دناب جواکا سوریه دا ناکوکین مذهبی و اولی ارقی پر کور چه ببن بسالانه ببن نخاشیه که که پر شکل که خراب هشمندی جواکا ما باندور بکه و به صدن گلک پرس گره کن دناب خواده جیان بکه
We've already talked a little bit about U.S. foreign policy, but how does that U.S. foreign policy towards Syria generally and the Northeast specifically impact the lives of religious and ethnic minorities under the autonomous administration and its ability to carry out its stated commitment to religious freedom? Burası siyaseta Amerika deherime da ve bandoru tesiri. Jibuy bina eğer piraneke van vazih burak pek hebe en bavarın ve jibuy halke herimi ve de tışkiriyeke mezin ya ditir de herim ameda ev tek uşina kuru dici terörü ha tekirin ev grupu tündrav hatın bin hıstın ve pişkiriye Amerika u haval bendin me yeğen tahalüf etçi bun evci rezu takdiri tabi u her oha habuna koalisyonu u hezin Amerika u berpirsen Amerika dendir herimi da tabi gringe و جوش و مورال اگر دیده که آرامیه که به استقراره که به بیاوایی جارده اندویجن امبهیوینه هبونو بردام تحالف و هزن امریکی جبو جیان هربش گرینگه حیانی چهار سریه که سیاسی چی بب گرینگ هبونا وانا دهندی هری میدان جبوی بیجی دوید چرچوا باز سیاستا کوچوا جیان که هربش حراسنا حمو چندان اولان تبگر اندیشن باندور تسلیه که وی گرینگ هر بی در باره دان ام دبینن نیرینا ما و رفیق آمریکا د با مجارا حمو نتاو حمو چاند حمو اول باوری به هر جیان کردن نیرنه ما و که هب و ام حد و عالیجی پشگیری دادن به فکر و به پروژه جبویی ام دبیشن فرصت اثر کردن به پروژه به پشگیریا رفیق آمریکا و دهان زیاد بود. Thank you so much, Bedran, for sharing your perspective today on behalf of the Autonomous Administration in North and East Syria. We really appreciate you joining us. Now we will convene our second panel, comprised of expert witnesses Thomas Perot, Max Hoffman, David Phillips, and Dustin Jasmine, who will address conditions affecting freedom of religion or belief in Syria and related US policy. To view the panel's biographies, please see the Zoom chat feature where we will share the link to the webpage. Our first witness is Thomas Perret, a senior researcher at Aix Marseille University in France. His research focuses on politics and religion in modern Syria. Welcome. I think you're mute. So ladies and gentlemen, members of the committee, thank you for your invitation. So I was asked to address two questions today. Uh, the first one is how has the Assad regime transformed the secular and democratic revolution of 2011 into a brutal sectarian conflict? In the first months of the 2011 uprising, the regime simultaneously implemented contradictory policies. On the one hand, it tried to convince minorities that it was fighting for their survival in the face of Sunni revanchism. For instance, as early as 18 April 2011, that is many months before radical Islamist factions started to play any significant role in the conflict, the Minister of Interior warned that demonstrators in the city of Homs were establishing a Salafi Emirate. Likewise, as part of its instrumentalization of sectarian tensions, the regime helped jihadi insurgents getting started by releasing hundreds of Islamist detainees. Uh, yet at the same time, the regime tried to reassure Sunnis by pretending it was only at war with an extremist Islamist fringe. What, had, what Assad was probably hoping for at the onset was that radical Islamist elements within the opposition would become visible enough to frighten minorities, mainstream Sunnis and foreign powers, while at the same time remaining too weak to pose a serious military challenge. 
From this viewpoint, the cause of the sectarianization of the Syrian uprising should not be primarily looked for in the regime's intentions, but rather in long-standing governance practices that have shaped the revolt as well as the incumbent responses to the latter. Cross sectarian networks of activists did operate in the early phase of the uprising, but they were rapidly debilitated by state repression. Non-Sunni activists in particular found themselves isolated due to strong disapproval of their political stance on the part of their co-religionists. Liberal activists who were not arrested, killed, or exiled sought refuge among local Sunni communities whose initially parochial challenge to the regime gradually took a more sectarian turn, largely in response to repressive practices that were themselves overly tainted by the regime's Alawite character. Such practices resulted from a lack of reliable manpower. Decades of sectarian stacking had provided the regime with a cohesive, Alawite-dominated coercive apparatus while making Sunni soldiers largely unreliable as a tool of domestic repression. The shortage of reliable manpower explains why, as early as in the spring of 2011, the regime resorted to plainclothes Alawite militiamen to suppress protests in the coastal Sunni majority town of Al Beita, for example. Over reliance on Alawite manpower also accounts for the sectarian humiliations inflicted upon arrested protesters who were frequently forced by, the, by their jailers to utter blasphemy. Such practices derived from a deeply ingrained subculture prevailing among the Alawite dominated armed forces, which for decades, most notably since the 1979-1982 failed Islamist insurgency, had considered Sunni religious conservatives as an existential threat. I'm not coming to the second question I was asked to address, which is how has the regime co-opted religious authority, mostly from the Sunni Muslim majority of Syria? The regime's heavy handed management of Sunni Islam has changed considerably over the last two decades. Before that, Syrian authorities privileged an informal approach it was not official Islamic institutions, such as the Ministry of Religious Endowments, but the intelligence services that managed the religious field by granting or most often denying privileges, such as authorization, authorizations to run private Islamic institutes and charities. By the middle of this century's first decade, however, this policy of indirect rule was discredited because bargains and corruption had allowed Sunni clerics to carve out some genu genuine autonomy from the state, which they sometimes used to overtly criticize regime policies. By 2008, therefore, the appointment of new Minister of Religious Endowments, Mohammed Abdesattar Sayed, still in charge, marked a major policy shift that has shaped the regime's strategy until the present day. The new policy could be summarized as a nationalization of Sunni Islam through the expansion of the Ministry of Endowments Authority. This process first targeted hitherto private Islamic colleges. Secondly, in 2016, the ministry set up the so-called youth religious team to regiment junior clerics. Very much like the ruling Ba'ath party, the youth religious team is a patronage structure that, structure that members join in search of political and security benefits, such as positions in mosques. A third and last major step was the recent abolition of the position of Grand Mufti and its replacement with a collegial body called the Scholarly Committee of Jurisprudence, which is chaired by the minister himself. This decision sent shockwaves among the Syrian opposition, among which it was widely interpreted as a brazen attack on the country's Sunni religious identity. Yet the regime's decision probably had less to do with, long, with an anti-Sunni strategy than with Minister Sayed's maneuvers to achieve a long-standing objective of the pro-regime Sunni religious elite. For decades, uh, the latter has been dissatisfied with existing institutional arrangements, which excluded them in favor of a lone Grand Mufti, who was at the same time ineffective. He hardly ever issued fatwa since the 1960s, and in the case of the last Grand Mufti Ahmed Hassoun, 
held religious views they post so uh, mainstream or uh, leading religious scholars perceived as repulsive, notably quasi secularists and pro Shia or pro Iranian views. By replacing the Grand Mufti with a collegial body, the regime has rewarded those religious scholars who remained loyal through, throughout the conflict by granting them formal authority to police the religious field and cleanse it not only of, of extremist ideas, but also of any opinion contrary to traditional Sunni orthodoxy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your testimony. A reminder that um, all the testimony from those witness, our witnesses today will be on the USERF website under the, the Syria hearing page. Now we are joined by Max Hoffman, Director of the National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress in Washington, DC, where he focuses on Turkey and Kurdish regions, US defense policy and migration and security concerns. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to the distinguished commissioners for the opportunity to testify today on the, the ongoing conflict in Syria and its, its dire humanitarian effects. I've been asked to provide something of an overview of the security and stability challenges, particularly the threat of non-state actors in Idlib and Northwest Syria, and outline the implications for the humanitarian situation and maybe chart you know, some next steps on US policy. Uh, it's a lot of ground to cover, but first a few contextual points are I think important before diving into some details. The, you know, the fact is that Syria is not today a top tier US strategic priority. The administration is understandably focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the challenge of confronting China, COVID. Uh, it's a crowded strategic uh, picture. And that context is important for a few reasons. The, the first is that it means that there's a large emphasis placed by the US on sort of keeping things on an even keel, both in the Middle East generally and in Syria specifically. And given that reality, the US has welcomed most of the de-escalation and reconciliation efforts that have taken place over the last few years, with the notable exception um, that Daz Goldrich uh, highlighted of you know, complete opposition to any normalization with Assad. Um, the second important point that, that that illustrates is that it's hard to realistically recommend that the US do more in Syria beyond maintaining its presence and stabilization efforts in the Northeast and continuing to provide substantial humanitarian support. And you know, those realities are, I think, difficult for many of us who follow this conflict slowly and are, are very familiar with its human costs, um, but they're difficult to dispute analytically. So the US approach in Syria is premised on the reality that the conflict has, has settled into this uneasy stasis uh, despite continuing violence and that no political resolution is likely in the near term. Most of the outside powers can live with the status quo. Turkey is probably the least happy with it. Iran is probably the most likely to push the boundaries. But you know, given that the general acceptance, uh, the US decided some time ago that, that its approach would be one of general de-escalation, seeking to stabilize the current contours of the war and ease humanitarian suffering where possible. Uh, that's a utilitarian approach, certainly, but it's, you know, it's aimed at doing the most good for the most people. And in the areas where the US has direct influence, I know David will touch on this later, that you know, through the SDF, the main challenges are the disruptive attacks of outside powers like Turkey and Iran and their proxies, the lingering ISIS insurgency, and the challenge of managing Arab-Kurdish tensions and intra-Kurdish rivalries. Outside of the areas where the US has direct presence though, it's, it's a much more limited picture and, and very much focused on humanitarian aid, particularly the UN cross-border mechanism from Turkey on which you know, two and a half million Syrians are, are all, almost entirely reliant. So in the North and the Northwest, uh, beyond the dire economic and humanitarian situation, the, the picture is defined by First, military pressure, continuing military pressure from the Assad regime and Russia, Turkey's military presence in these areas, and the violent and ill-disciplined proxies uh, and armed groups that underpin that involvement. And this, you know, this area is really divided into four regions, each with distinct conditions. Afrin, the Euphrates Shield Zone, as it's known from Azaz to Jarablus, and the Turkish salient from Talabia to Ras al Ain, uh, and of course Idlib. And Turkey has a direct military presence in all of these areas, except Idlib, uh, administers them direct, directly, um, and has settled into a long, a long-term presence. You know, made substantial investments, built up militias under the banner of the Syrian National Army, 
and set up proxy councils to deliver basic services. This is underpinned by Ankara's sort of two main goals. One was to uh, cripple any prospect of Kurdish political autonomy. And the second was to insulate against further displacement from Syria. And they hoped provide areas where Syrians might be resettled from Turkey. Um, so, you know, that, that I think is an un unlikely prospect given the deep roots many Syrians have put down in Turkey, but that is uh, certainly a primary goal. And those, those primary goals I don't think are going anywhere. And that is part of why uh, Turkey has, has settled into such a long-term presence. Um, and part of why also these enclaves are so reliant on Turkey. Um, but the provision, you know, the humanitarian conditions, the provision of basic services in these areas is, is complicated by a number of security factors. We mentioned the regime. There's also, of course, a lingering Kurdish insurgency in Afrin in particular. But the biggest concern is the SNA proxies themselves. And Ankara's desire to lighten its direct security load has led them to rely on these groups. But the chaos that they sow is a major reason why international actors can't do more to improve the humanitarian situation in these areas. And fear of these armed groups is a main reason why Syrians are reluctant to resettle from Turkey into these areas. Um, you know, in Afrin, which has gotten understandably a lot of attention, human rights, rights abuses are widespread. There is massive displacement of Kurdish residents. Turkey has resettled IDPs, and, you know, particularly families of their proxy fighters from other parts of Syria into Afrin. And that legacy uh, really shapes the continuing um, violence and instability of that region. Things are, it also makes it impossible for the US and the international community to, to really engage fulsomely to improve lives in those areas. Um, you know, the Euphrates Shield Zone, Talabiyad to Ras Alain are a little better. Turkey's totally dominant in these areas and relies on violent proxies to administer them um, and has proven itself unwilling or unable to rein them in uh, despite well-documented human rights abuses. And finally, there is Idlib, which is you know, the largest outstanding issue in Syria today, you know, primarily controlled by 50,000 Syrian rebels dominated by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and behind the protective shield of some 10,000 Turkish troops ringing the perimeter. This, within this perimeter, some 3 million Syrians are you know, living in desperate conditions. Uh, it also, Idlib of course holds Bab al-Hawa, the primary, the only UN cross-border um, crossing in, in this region, and has also provided a haven for some very radical uh, and relative autonomy for some very radical groups. I think that you know, the picture moving forward is characterized by a form of mutual dependency between the HTS and Turkey. HTS needs Turkey's protection to stave off a regime attack and potential annihilation by the regime backed by Russia, while Turkey needs HDS to defend this area and to administer it to avoid taking on a new and substantial direct administrative burden. I think there's a parallel balance on the Russian and regime side where the regime likely has the desire but not the ability to prosecute a decisive campaign against Idlib and reassert sovereignty, while Russia has or perhaps had the ability but not the desire to do so, uh, being content to play the long game of trying to sort of peel Turkey away from the Western security architecture. So, you know, I think the current ceasefire in Idlib hardly meets the definition. There's regular violence, both at the line of control between the rebels and the regime, but also constant infighting and insecurity and abuses within Idlib, uh, as in Afrin and the other areas of Turkish proxy control. So I'll leave it there, but there's much more to get into in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really um, interesting and kind of discouraging. Um, um, remarks, but we, we really do appreciate it. Um, our next witness will be David Phillips, who is the Director of Programming on Peace Building and Rights at Columbia University's Institute for the Study of Human Rights. He's the author of several books, including Frontline Syria, From Revolution to Proxy War. Oh, you're on mute. Um, Karen Mayanza, thank you for inviting me to today's hearing. My remarks focus on violations of religious freedom by Turkey and crimes committed by their jihadist mercenary proxies in North and East Syria, the NES. 
Beginning in 2014, jihadists rampaged through Armenian, Syriac, and Christian Arab communities, killing thousands and desecrating symbols of their Christian faith. Yazidis were also targeted in Sinjar and across the NES. ISIS launched a worldwide jihad. The ISIS magazine Dabit displayed images of crucified Christians as a quote, message of blood written to the nation of the cross. It published an image of St. Peter's Square with an ISIS flag superimposed atop its holy obelisk. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi said his fighters would march all the way to Rome, toppling crosses and abducting Christian women. The Armenian Christian presence in Syria dates to biblical times. Additionally, up to 100,000 survivors of the Armenian genocide settled in Syria in the 1920s, seeking sanctuary for their church and civilization. In July 2012, Armenians in Aleppo were attacked and about 170 were slaughtered. More than 100 were taken hostage and forced to pay a ransom for their release. Armenian churches in Aleppo were destroyed. The Karen Yepe Armenian school was ransacked and 1,300 students were displaced. Kesab, an Armenian Christian town in Syria's Northwest, was attacked on March 21, 2014. 670 Armenian families in Kesab were uprooted and 15 families were taken hostage. ISIS exacted a protection tariff called Jizya. When ISIS occupied a Christian community, it offered a stark choice, forced conversion, slavery, extortion, or execution. Syriacs are the second largest uh, Christian community in Syria, dating back to 2500 BC. Syriacs resided primarily in the Kabur Valley of the Jazeera governorate. ISIS seized ancient churches in Homs, Aleppo, and Damascus, converting them to mosques, madrasas, and prisons. Between 2011 and 2015, hundreds of Syriacs were executed and thousands displaced. In 2015 and 2016, the US, the EU, and the British Parliament all declared that the persecution of Christians by ISIS amounted to genocide. When ISIS invaded Northern Iraq in June 2014, at least 5,000 Yazidi males were killed. Thousands of Yazidi women and girls were forced into sexual slavery. When US forces pulled back from Afrin, the Yazidis were left unprotected in 23 villages and towns. 19 Yazidi shrines in Afrin were destroyed by ISIS. The Yazidi Union headquarters, the statue of the prophet Zarathustra, the dome of Lalish, and the Ayn Dara temple were destroyed. Yazidis were taken prisoner and tortured. They were stripped of gold jewelry and personal possessions. ISIS demanded a ransom for each Yazidi of up to $25,000. Those who could not pay were murdered. The Turkish administration in Northern Syria settled the families of mercenaries in Yazidi villages where residents had been forcibly displaced. The Turkish-backed Free Syrian Army invaded the NES in 2018 during Operation Olive Branch. They beheaded Kurdish defenders, raping and mutilating the bodies of Kurdish women, cutting off their breasts, and posing for selfies with their body parts. Local youth were recruited for Turkish propaganda. They were forced to carry Turkish flags and appear in videos thanking Tayyip Erdogan. Street names were translated into Turkish and Arabic, youth were forced to enroll in madrasas and women were required to cover themselves. More than 300,000 civilians fled Afrin for Til Rafat and the Sheba regions. Another 300,000 were displaced the following year during Turkey's Operation Peace Spring. Arar al-Sharkiya, a jihadist group under Turkey's control, assassinated Hevrin Kalaf, Secretary General of the Syrian party and 10 of her colleagues by the side of the M4 highway. One jihadi kicked Kalaf's body saying, this is the corpse of a pig. ISIS acted as Turkey's agent in the NES. Turkey's National Intelligence Agency, MEETS, facilitated the flow of 40,000 foreign fighters from approximately 80 countries 
from San Liorfa to Raqqa in Syria. Meat provided them with weapons, money, and communications equipment. During a speech at Harvard University in October 2014, uh, then Vice President Biden said, our biggest problem is our allies, our allies who are engaged in a proxy Sunni-Shia conflict. Turkey was the lifeline for ISIS beginning in 2014. Turkey professed its loyalty to the global coalition fighting ISIS, but it played a double game. To US officials, counterterrorism means fighting ISIS. Turkish officials view counterterrorism as killing Kurds and destroying the PKK. I'd like to include some recommendations in my remarks. In accordance with the International Religious Freedom Act, 1988, Turkey meets the criteria for designation as a country of particular concern, and it should be so designated. As an interim measure, the US could put Turkey on a special watch list. The US should provide Turkey with specific criteria for removal from the SWL. Turkey should be given 12 months to adopt measures leading to its removal from the special watch list. If it fails to act, Turkey should be designated a country of particular concern. I had the chance this morning to address a group in Afrin. We discussed these measures. Uh, their resilience and courage is remarkable. Uh, they take heart in the fact that uh, your commission is convening this discussion and I'll be providing my testimony to them and others. Thank you very much for having the hearing and for including me. Thank you for that powerful testimony. Um, our next and final witness is Dastin Jesen, a doctoral researcher at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies and a doctoral student at the Frederick Alexander University in Lagen, Nuremberg. Her research focuses on the civil culture of Kurds in Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey, as well as on security developments in the Kurdish regions. Thank you so much, uh, Nadine, and thanks very much to the Commission um, for having my testimony on this very important topic. Um, so I was asked to provide a testimony on the specific governance that the specific administrational system that we have in the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria and the effects that this administration has had on um, religious and different uh, minorities in uh, Northeast Syria. Um, there are many different uh, groups in this area, as uh, the previous um, testimonies have pointed out. And what is really important to keep in mind and to remember before looking at this is that many of these groups actually, Kurds, Assyrians, Arameans, Armenians are actually descendants of people that have ju survived genocide under the Ottoman Empire and later under Kemalist Turkey. So these are really people that are a living memory to what this region is and what this region was and what this region should not be in future. While there has been attempts by the Ba'athi um, government previously to um, you know, uh, co-opt religious minorities as has been pointed out uh, previously, um, there was also a strong um, uh, political um, uh, oppression and security level oppression of uh, Kurdish Kurdish groups and but nevertheless Kurdish parties Kurdish organizations have started to organize from the 1920s on actually especially organizing also in the context of other Kurdish uh, uprisings but it was not until the Arab Spring that these organizations could really hold foot and really um, claim territory specifically since we all know from 2010, 2011 on, the Assad regime was not able to fully control the whole region and especially the three cantons as they were called back then, Afrin, Jazeera and Kobani, um, uh, you know, declared this kind of autonomy in 2012. Um, overall, the political system that we have in the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria is a bottom-up grassroots system. It's basically called a democratic conf uh, confederalism, and it is inspired by different theories of uh, overall, we can say, libertarian uh, socialist thinkers um, like uh, Maureen Bookchin and others that have specifically looked at the post-Soviet space and have been wondering how um, uh, political and social liberalization and um, uh, emancipation can happen without having state-centered systems that can quickly become author authoritarian, which is um, especially important in that case. 
Um, this is very evident in the Syrian case, and it is showing that this is not only a question of the Kurdish question, it's not only a Kurdish problem that we have here, but it's a overall question that we have that is about how do we deal with democratization, how do we deal with centralization or decentralization, how do we deal with different groups that do not necessarily want to be assimilated to be part of a functioning administration, how can we actually take care of these people, how can they organize themselves. And that is a very, very crucial question, because one thing that happened, happens with societies that um, have to live through decades and decades of authoritarian rule, especially under the rule of uh, late Hafez al-Assad and then Bashar al-Assad um, from 2000 on, is that societies in these authoritarian um, uh, regimes are specifically trained to not trust each other. They are trained to work against each other. They are trained to cheat on each, uh, each other, to use each other, to oppress each other. As we know, authoritarianism is not only a political system, but it is really a psychological system. And what has happened through this kind of bottom-up system is that we have kind of developed a space there. There's kind of a space there where both people are organizing themselves in these so-called communes, which are then on the higher level organized as districts and region. And then on the other side, you have a connection between these communes. And this is working for religious communities as well. This is something that we see with, for example, Aramean communities with, communities with um, Yazidi communities that since these Yazidi and Armenian and many other communities have already been marginalized and often discriminated against by state policies, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Turkey, many other countries, um, they have developed their own spaces, they have developed their own kind of systems. And these kind of systems find a place in this type of bottom up system, while at the same time, while at the same time, it is giving the possibility that this kind of self-organization, bottom-up organization, is actually following some core democratic principles, that these organizations are somehow linked to each other, connected to each other. This is especially important in a civil war context. And we see this most evidently in Iraq, where you know, we have a, a multitude of militias that have emerged in the fight against ISIS, and now we have the struggle of connecting to, to each other. While in the Syrian Democratic Forces, while in the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria, from the beginning on, there was the point to have this decentralized system, but to actually have a system that is connecting them. And this is what has happened, and this is what has happened very much on the ground for religious minority as well, because we have had groups like um, you know, the Syriac Military Council, different Syriac, different Aramean and uh, Assyrian and even Armenian groups, um, uh, as well as the uh, Yebeshe that were on the other side of the border in Iraq fighting against ISIS. So what happened is that a big group of minorities that have been trained to not trust each other, all of a sudden had to stick together and fight against one common enemy, which is ISIS. And this has obviously had massive repercussions. And this has led to a situation where really a lot of mistrust could be pushed away and a lot could be done to make the situation better. Right now, we really have a situation. This is something that is really seconded by a lot of people that even before have been um, you know, uh, um, quite pessimistic about the situation is that we there was really a success not only against ISIS, but there was also a success against decades of this kind of authoritarian um, uh, uh, sit situation, authoritarian also mindset that has grown. And many people have really grown together. Many communities have grown together. Obviously, this is right now under attack. Um, you know, the, the previous speakers have really pointed this out, and it's really important to, um, you know, just follow up on the fact that, especially in April, a lot of the attacks that have been, have been happening, a lot of the um, attacks that have, have been happening by the Turkish Air Force um, were directed towards Tal Temer, and Tal Temer is hosting one of the oldest Armenian and Assyrian um, uh, communities that we have in the region it was actually one of the first regions that were liberated from ISIS. Um, and this is really important to keep in mind. And this has been really serious. In April 2022, for example, we have the commander of the Syrian military, uh, Syriac military forces, Oron Maruga, who was um, injured along uh, with uh, his, his colleague. And we also see repeatedly that troops are killed, civilians are killed in this kind of context. And we see that a really, really old community that has literally survived genocide in 1915 is really on the verge of not having any possibility of staying there. 
Now, when we come to the recommendations, of course, it's important to stay realistic, but let's also stay realistic about the comparisons that we have. Um, we right now have a situation where there is a war, there is a direct war on the Ukrainian population. And on the other side, we have Russia, which is a nuclear power. So let's say things are not looking good there anyways, but there are red lines to draw. And I think red lines are where we are drawing them when it comes to genocide, when it comes to ethnic cleansing, for which there are multiple, multiple evidences that this is happening. So as much as we could say in many different conflicts that you know it's unrealistic or it's unsafe to do this or that, it is also really right now not an option to say nothing. Um, we have just recently had an announcement two days ago by Erdogan that he wants to relocate at least a million Syrian refugees. And looking at the economic situation in Syria, a lot of Syrian refugees are really, um, you know, the lower class. They are really people that cannot survive this economic situation. So for many of them, being relocated in these areas, which is actively um, uh, reinforcing ethnic cleansing, is actually economically viable option for a lot of these people. Because this is, you know, this is this is economically doable for a lot of these people. Um, I really, really recommend if it is not really a direct push, but at the end of the day to really look at the issue of acknowledgement, because at the end of the day, people in this region, especially minorities, uh, the religious minorities that are already under attack, they need some sort of security. You know, you cannot expect from a group of several, maybe hundreds of people, thousands of people to bargain with their lives, to bargain with their communities, to build up a literal democratic alternative while being under attack. For a lot of these people at the end, migrating for the good is the next best option. And if we are allowing that, well, that is basically facilitating ethnic cleansing. And on the other side, we have just recently heard a statement um, by uh, President Joe Biden um, that there is a possibility to sell F-16 um, jets to Turkey this year. Um, these are things that can be not done. These are things that you cannot do. These are things that you cannot provide for Turkey to continue this kind of stuff. So we're not going for the very utopian ideas, utopian solutions, but very specific solutions. And that would be for now to cut the arms sale and to specifically go for some kind of recognition. If it's not in Syria right now, there are many types of recognition and even decriminalization of Kurdish movement and these affiliated groups, not only in, in Syria, but uh, uh, abroad from Syria. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, that testimony, um, a combination of encouraging and then of course, um, the, the huge problems um, that we're facing and, and the limit of US policy in there um, with so far with dealing with some of them. Um, so now um, we're gonna go to a time of, of question and answers um, with my colleagues that I'm looking forward to. And um, I'll go ahead and start um, with a, a two-parter um, really on, on use of recommendations. We've, we've made some pretty bold ones. Um, to support religious freedom in Syria. And one of them was um, the two, um, for the US government to, to um, do a general waiver for sanctions in the Northeast. We often make recommendations to punish with sanctions and why not reward by lifting sanctions. We'd love to hear your comment on the potential effects of that, both on the Northeast, but also on, on the Assad regime. And, and the second part would really be our other recommendation to include you know, ANES and a political solution. Obviously, Turkey is not going to allow, I mean, they're going to war um, with, you know, they're attacking, they're not going to allow since they do control the opposition at this point. Um, it, you know, could the US do a, a parallel process with the ANES in Geneva, something like that in order to make it so that the one successful government in Syria that controls one third that has these positive conditions so that they could be a part of, of the solution. So I'll, I'll jump to you first, David. <laughs> and you're mute. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nadine. So the problem with, with governance in Syria was always centralization. And the fact that the, the NES has been a laboratory for democratic developments and human rights is, is noteworthy. Uh, it deserves support. Uh, as a laboratory, there are some important lessons learned about decentralized governance, about women's rights, environmental sustainability. When we look towards a longer term solution for Syria, uh, the principles and lessons learned from the NES uh, provide important instruction 
as to how Syria can be governed in the future. So we should be supporting this laboratory uh, as a haven for religious freedom, as a bastion of human rights. And then as we think a little bit about the constitutional committee that the UN has been forming, we should look at those lessons learned and try to apply them more broadly nationwide. I think the same thing can be said about Iraq. The problem with Iraqi governance has always been the centralization of power. So the more we diffuse power to the regions in both Iraq and Syria, the more stable and peaceful those countries can be. Any of the other witnesses like to jump in on that? Oh, go ahead, Max, and then Dustin. Sure. Well, I think that you know the the prospect of a fundamental political settlement still remains very far out of reach, and I think that the you know the U.S. position has been reinforced by President Biden's clear presidential level commitment to the SDF and to the mission in North and East Syria. And while that mission is still very carefully couched in terms of, uh, and legitimately couched in terms of keeping the pressure on ISIS, I think that there has always been, for some US officials anyway, this secondary level of you know, the calculation that if by maintaining the SDF's relative autonomy and the US deterrence, um, against the Assad regime and the Russians, and for periods anyway, Turkey and its proxies, that you know, by maintaining leverage and control of this portion of the country, it would give bargaining power at the eventual table you know, of, of an eventual political settlement. I think that logic still holds. Of course, you know, it's, it's very, there are just very difficult um, questions around maintaining the deterrence. You know, how do you respond to Turkey's use of drones or the mm -hmm. shelling and the you know, the skirmishing that goes all on along the line of the kind of salami slicing approach that occurs along the line of control along, uh, in, along the M4 in the north um, or along the Euphrates um, in Deir ez -Zor. It's It's an extremely difficult thing. Now, the other challenge, of course, is that Iran, the regime, Turkey are all trying to undermine this experiment in autonomy and are trying to do that principally through pressure on the borders, which I just talked about, but also through trying to peel off certain factions and groups within the autonomous region. And, you know, there, I think the, there are two key pieces. One gets back to your question, and I'm, I, <laughs> I'm mindful of trying to answer it. Uh, you know, one is the economic and social conditions, which are, you know, dire and um, mm -hmm. the drought and the general economic crisis I have just made them worse in the East. And so if a sanctions waiver is an important part of improving those conditions, then I think it's something that should certainly be, be considered and be done. Um, you know, the other piece is just what the Biden administration has done last year in announcing new and sustained assistance for um, all of Syria, including the, the autonomous region. Um, the other piece though is really, is something the US can control the AINES to do, but can't force them to do. And that is to ensure that alongside this religious tolerance, um, there is a broadening of the political base and political foundation for the AANES. And, you know, in that vein, I think the recent last couple of months have been somewhat discouraging in terms of the, the attacks on KNC offices in, in, um, in the Northeast. And and that's a long-term challenge, right? Because both because this the ANES really only stands uh, a chance long-term if it is genuinely broad-based and inclusive politically as well as, as well as socially and religiously and ethnically. Um, but but also because if the U.S. is a, and the international coalition is ever able to change Turkey's policy, perhaps in the wake of an election uh, next year, it will, as a necessary component, it will have to include the ability to demonstrate that this is not in Turkey, you know, in Turkey's eyes, that that the Northeast is not a PKK statelet, and whether or not you know those of us on the panel fully agree with that interpretation or not, I think that is the reality in Ankara that we just have to try to grapple with. So, hopefully, I somewhat answered your question. But <laughs> thank you so much, Dustin. Thank you. Um, 
Well, to, to, to also add something on the point of the sanctions waiver, of course, the sanctions waiver would be really helpful because um, Northeast Syria is really struggling economically and also Northeast Syria is hosting a multitude of not only civilians, but also thousands of IDPs adding to thousands of ISIS fighters and ISIS detainees that somehow the administration is left alone with, although this has been somehow an international fight against terror. Um, so that is important, but the question is, even if you have this waiver, how does stuff get into the country? We have the situation, as was already mentioned, we only have Bab al Hawa um, uh, allowed to be an official UN um, border crossing, but then we have no waiver for uh, uh, Yarubia border crossing. You know, we repeatedly have issues because of Samalka border crossing. Um, so people really quickly talk about the issue of smuggling when it comes to Kurds. But if you have international regimes that are effectively, you know, drawing borders that do not allow anything to go from the one side to the other side, then that's where you have smuggling. And what we have seen right now is that, um, you know, that in the last months, the Iraqi government is actually building a wall between Syria and Iraq and the they're specifically doing that uh, precisely on the routes where in 2014, uh, all of these Yazidi people that were fleeing from uh, ISIS genocide um, could have been saved. And to this day, we know from Yazidis, for example, that they often get medical treatment or they get other stuff from the other side in Syria. They just go there and you know, uh, have possibilities there to also engage, to also get services done, um, to 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 um, have uh, you to you know you to have um, an economic relationship, all of these things. And these are realities, not because people love smuggling or people love illicit stuff, but because um, you know these are all re regions that have historically been um, deprived of this kind of uh, possibility to have autonomous trade, to really engage and to be a part of this region. So this is very important to, to keep in mind that there should also be a legality in which how Ennis can um, deal with other um, countries and uh, you know use this kind of waiver. The second issue is, I want to second on what Max said, of course, it's very important to have a broad um, political base, but, you know, we should always remember the first Kurdish example was just uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, where I am right now. And, you know, in the 90s, uh, everything was done to specifically do that. We had the Washington Agreement. We had Maldry, uh, uh, Madeleine Albright bringing two sides together and both of them signing officially that they will do anything to fight against the PKK. They will do everything that Turkey wants. And still we're here in 2022 and Iraqi Kurdistan is being attacked almost every day. Um, from various positions on. So the issue is probably not really, and you know, these are not really easy answers. These are not easy recommendations, but this is the underlying issue after 31 years of practice that we have seen in Iraq is that at the end of the day, it is about Turkey not accepting that they have a Kurdish question and that they are actively occupying Kurdish land. This is just the point. And they are occupying Armenian land, they are occupying Assyrian land. That is just what is happening. And at the end of the day, I'm sure there can be a political solution with KNC, but that is not an internal Kurdish con um, uh, fight. It is a proxy war. It is unfortunately a proxy war. KNC can be on whatever side they want to be, but KNC is actively on the Turkish side as much as the KDP in Iraq is on the Turkish side. If they choose to be that, they can be that, but that is just actively following a proxy sh scheme. And that is the big problem. So we should really keep an eye on Turkey and we should also keep an eye on the elections next year, which are going to decide what policymakers are actively going to be in charge in Ankara, who are going to be the decision makers, who, what kind of military budget they're gonna set up. That is very, very important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And then it's the thing, Turkey is not a, like Turkey's regime and Turkey's approach is not an unchangeable fact. At the end of the day, this system is pro forma democratic. And there is a lot of people in this country that are unhappy with the situation. People like Osman Kavala that are still in prison. So I think for the US, it's very important to have a transnational approach. This is transnationally about democratization. Thank you. I know, David, your hand is up again. Go ahead. But, but you're mute. Great. It's so important that we have a realistic approach towards Turkey. Uh, we should see it as it is, not as it was, or we wish it to be. And right now, Turkey is a toxic influence in the region. Columbia University is going to be publishing a major study this week looking at collusion between Turkey and Russia. Uh, <clears throat> Turkey's been aggressing in across the region, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Artsakh. Uh, the US needs to see Turkey, not as we wish it were, but as it is. We should adjust our policies accordingly. Uh, 
that kind of adult conversation is the best way to bring Turkey back in the tent. Uh, with elections coming up, Turkish voters have a chance to express their concerns uh, and to talk about uh, reform and regime change through a democratic process, which is indigenous and homegrown. Uh, the only basis for that is seeing things realistically and adjusting US and international policy accordingly. Thank you. Any others? Um, if not, I'll hand off um, to my colleagues to ask questions. Um, would, would either of you um, like to ask a question? Go ahead, Commissioner Kleinbaum. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, whomever would like to respond to this, uh, Syria has had a long and rich history of having a Jewish community uh, for really over a thousand, maybe even 2,000 mm -hmm. years. And um, there have been reports that Assad has been reaching out to the diaspora Syrian Jewish community. And I'm wondering if anybody can enlighten us about that element of this situation. David, are you, do you want to speak? I, I can uh, say a word here. Thank you. Um, I visited Syria with my father maybe 20 years ago. We interviewed members of the Syrian Jewish community. The purpose of it was to look at minorities, ethnic and religious. And I can say that during our meetings, the Syrian Jews were terrified of speaking freely. They knew there were minders in the room and they were worried that their message would be recorded and there would be reprisals and recrimination. I don't think very much has changed. You know, we need to see the regime in Damascus realistically, but the more pluralistic and tolerant Turkey, excuse me, Syria becomes, uh, the more we can move forward uh, with the constitutional committee uh, and other negotiations. We don't want Syria to be a pariah state forever, but, Turkey, but Syria has to earn its way back into the family of nations by mm -hmm. demonstrating religious tolerance uh, and an inclusive and transparent system of governance based on human rights and respect for religious and ethnic minorities, including Kurds. Yes, Thomas. Yes, well, I, I, I just on the, the, the question of the Jewish community in Syria, I, I know little about it, but I, I suspect, you know, this community might be entirely extinct uh, today. Because I, I remember like 15 years ago in, in a place like Aleppo, uh, I talked with some friends who, who told me about you know, Jewish people, but they were talking, I mean, according to them, it was a, a handful of, of people, of elderly people. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that 15 years later, there might be no one left. And, and they were a bit more in, in Damascus, but also mostly elderly people. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's true, the, the, there's a huge Syrian Jewish diaspora here in the United States that came before Assad, obviously, really mostly in the 50s. Um, but the question is that we've just been hearing some mention that Assad has been actively courting members of the large Syrian Jewish diaspora. So do you have a sense of what that goal is? Is that true? Um, is that something that you've heard as well? But absolutely, most of the Syrian Jewish community fled Syria um, in the 50s and actually early 60s. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry I don't know anything about the, the, the diaspora. I just had, I think the, the most of the, the last people left actually in the 90s when they yeah. were granted visas, I mean, and, and they were allowed but to the leave. The big numbers because, were, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the, you're, you're right. There's a, I doubt there's much left there, but the question is, is Assad trying to court the Jewish diaspora as we've been hearing, or is that just not? I, I have no idea, I'm sorry. Um, Dustin, and then David. I would just like to say a word about the strategy that is behind this kind of approach. You know, I mean, they are kind of, you know, spreading these kind of words here and there. This is both the case for Syria, sometimes for Turkey, Iraq as well. Um, what we're seeing is that, you know, we still have a very anti-Semitic discourse that is happening both in this region as in many, many other countries in the world. And this anti-Semitic discourse is in many cases trying to deny 
that there is a indigenousness to Jewish people to this region. So what sometimes these uh, actors are trying to do is that they're saying, well, we can kind of give you back the claim to indigenousness if you just come to our political side, we're going to protect you, and then you're going to somehow be where you belong to. And this is what has been happening with many countries that are now, after decades, trying to claim their Jews in an attempt to present themselves in a, you know, um, uh, open-minded or let's say tolerant way, and also to get into discourses that are in general catching attention. But I would say um, the, the the essence of these kind of approaches are inherently anti-Semitic because this is specifically saying, well, um, you know, if you follow our lead, then you are allowed to exist in this and that country. But wherever you are right now, you are not safe. You cannot be there. And that is something very dangerous that this reproduced because the issue is that, you know, not only we should be for religious freedom, but we just are, we should be for religious groups being able to govern themselves to have some kind of you know say in what is happening it's not only them always having to live under some kind of um, big ruler that is protecting them and that has been the discourse on the Baathism for decades. This cannot be the claim uh, about, uh, about from that. And that is actually, uh, you know, this is the, this is the um, prospect that we have in Northeast Syria. It should be about these people being equals, these people being able to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to be active citizens. And this kind of discourses that they are spreading, these kind of, I really have to say, um, you know, uh, uh, fake claims that they are spreading, um, are actually just reproducing this image of um, religious uh, minorities, quote unquote, being um, you know coerced under some kind of authoritarian rule. Interesting, David. I can't speak to the details of outreach to the diaspora, um, but I can say that this outreach is cynical and it's politically motivated. Uh, efforts to curry favor uh, with Jews worldwide and Jews in the United States are really entirely about normalizing relations with the US. It looks at the APAC model and views it as an influential body. It's trying to manipulate APAC so that Syria can be in Washington's good graces. Uh, fundamentally, dialogue is, is a good thing. But finally, Damascus should be judged not by what it says, by what it does. Right. And the jury's definitely out on that. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Khan? Um, Commissioner Khan? Yeah, I think you are mute. Commissioner Khan, would you like to ask a question? Um, I sat in awe of uh, our experts' presentation. Uh, I have a very narrow question uh, while I pay tribute to. Uh, to your valor and for being the voice of the voiceless. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your, 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 your courage and your continued work. Uh, uh, my very narrow question is uh, from the commission's perspective, uh, within the limits of our mandate, uh, what are your recommendations that uh, we would be doing, we could be doing uh, to make sure that uh, concerns are addressed. Uh, our report highlights some of the concerns that you have expressed, but in addition to providing a platform, is there anything else that you suggest we could be doing, we should be doing to uh, address the concerns that you have expressed in your testimony? Thank you. David, do you want to start? Go ahead. In the spirit of decentralization, the topics that we're talking about today should be discussed among Syria's different communities. They should have a voice. They should have input. If we're formulating policy recommendations for the US, we should take their concerns on board. So to speak directly to your question, Mr. Kham, uh, the more we engage the victims of persecution in solutions to remedy persecution, the closer we get to a more tolerant and open society. We're far from that place in Syria, but this hearing could be localized uh, 
starting in the north and eastern part of Syria and involving other communities so that their views are heard and incorporated mm -hmm. into a set of policy recommendations. Great. Yes, go ahead, Max. Well, I would, I would certainly echo what David said. I think um, that is an important role. The, the other two things I would, I would highlight are, um, you know, we are shifting into the phase of accountability and reconciliation and in parts of Syria reconstruction. And so, you know, along those lines, focusing your, your attention, um, A, on continuing to bring attention to the abuses and, you know, particularly in a place like Afrin, the, the need to document, to continue to draw attention to the abuses and eventually to move towards, you know, a model of reconciliation where those displaced can return, can, you know, have access to their old homes and businesses. I think that's the only that's the only way we can cultivate long term stability. And the same goes, of course, for the Northeast. Um, but the other part is that, you know, this commission and and its constituents, uh, it, it, it's a different constituency than um, the kind of traditional humanitarian assistance um, community. But the interests completely overlap, right? You know, the conditions for religious minorities and ethnic minorities as well will be helped significantly if just basic economic conditions improve, if basic services can be restored. And so mobilizing to the extent you can, mobilizing uh, political support and attention uh, around the ongoing humanitarian efforts in Syria is I think, I think absolutely critical. Um, and you know, that, that there's, there's a complicated piece to that because many parties, but particularly and most egregiously the regime have tried to weaponize humanitarian uh, mm -hmm. aid as a tool of sovereignty. And so, you know, navigating that is, is very tricky. That, that gets back to, I think, um, you know, Rabbi Kleinbaum, your, your question about, and David's very good response, I think, about how the, the regime, I think, is beginning this long-term effort of burnish or trying to recover its image and regain some basic legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. I don't think we can allow that to happen but we still have to continue to engage on the humanitarian issues. So that's a difficult path to, to chart, but I think that, that um, Commissioner Khan, your, uh, well, all of your voices on that front would be helpful, so. Thank you, Dustin, and then back to David. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I would really say, you know, it's the, the mandate of the commission is limited and the mandate of many institutions is limited. So at the end of the day, um, you guys probably know best how to do your job. But I think pretty much the, the three key points that I would focus on and with that, I'm uh, definitely also seconding what um, uh, my previous colleagues have said. Um, the three most important things are peace, status and prosperity. Peace, because there is constant attacks on these areas. Like we're really facing a situation where these ethnic cleansing campaigns are almost successful. Like at this point, the autonomous administration is governing mostly people that belong to the majority society because so many other people have been actively displaced. This is like happening, you know? Um, these areas are still under occupation. These people are still living on the permanent the attacks. So doing whatever can be done to at least stop the war, stop the fighting, stop the constant attacks. And part of that would not be to be exporting weapons the whole time to Turkey is the first point and to urge the government the administration to not do that. The second point is the status, some type of acknowledgement of these groups because otherwise it's gonna be a permanent fear, not only vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, but also vis-a-vis -vis the people that are threatened by Assad. We know that Assad is actively threatening people that are, for example, Arabs that organize themselves in Raqqa and Deina Zur. Um, you know, they're sending them threats, they're sending them leaflets, telling them as soon as we're taking over these areas, you will see what you will get. And what we see is that not only Assad, but also Iran is expanding their presence in this area. So giving status and some security to these people that are really on the front line of the international war against terrorism should really be um, the least. And the third point is really prosperity, because we talked about humanitarian engagement, you know, in one way, as cynical as it seems, looking at the Iraqi Kurdish precedent, I have to say that I am somehow happy that this place has not become a huge NGO dependent um, semi-autonomy that cannot produce stuff for itself, that is 
in, indefinitely, you know, dependent on um, donors and all this kind of stuff. We cannot afford that. What is really strong is a Northeast Syrian autonomy that is able to produce industrially, agriculturally on many, many levels and to really be economically self-reliant. Those are really the three most important points that any policy and any recommendation has to focus on. Thank you. And yeah, during our recommendations, part of the reasons we had recommended the sanctions, as we knew, you know, they're going to either become an aid economy or a commerce economy, and, and the U.S. is going to decide that. So we're, you know, hope, hoping that that the, those recommendations get followed for, for that reason. Um, David, and you're mute. Thanks. So Max, you spoke about the model of reconciliation. Of course, we all believe that reconciliation is critical to a peaceful and prosperous future. But reconciliation needs to be reality-based. We can't allow the regime in Damascus to whitewash its crimes. Uh, so these kinds of discussions are important, not only today, but going forward in the future. Also, when we come to peace, it can only be achieved through justice. And there have been terrible violations of human rights, crimes against humanity. Uh, those can't be pushed aside. They need to be fu fully exposed and discussed in order for the society to heal and to move forward. And I just wanna also address Bastan's point about weapons in the region. And the reason why Turkey was barred from the F-35 stealth fighter program is because it acquired uh, S-400 missiles from Russia. Uh, when Turkey was asked to share the S-400 system with Ukraine, it declined. Uh, giving them advanced F-16 technology is completely inconsistent with a realistic approach to Turkey's role in the region. So if we want to see uh, reconciliation, it needs to involve dialogue between Syrians. The extent to which external powers influence that or manipulate events need to be guarded against and weaponizing, giving additional sophisticated weapons to Turkey, which by the way, it used on April 17th when it attacked Northern Iraq, is totally inconsistent with the idea of promoting peace and harmony in the region and allowing social harmony to prevail in war-torn societies. Thank you. Thomas? Yes, I'm sorry if it's not a very practical recommendation, but I'd like to emphasize an important distinction uh, as far as the regime is concerned, uh, which is between religious freedom and religious tolerance. Mm. Uh, because if you look at the, at the regime, I mean, it's record in terms of, of religious tolerance towards communities like, you know, Christians or Druze. I mean, it's, it's almost decent, uh, if you want. But uh, the, there are very serious problems of religious freedom, which right. actually mostly concern the, the, the Sunni majority. And if you look at you know, the, the daily life, the daily life of, of a Sunni cleric is like, you know, you know, going through, you know, requesting authorizations for absolutely everything. Like any basic religious activity uh, requires, you know, clearing from or clearance from, from the, the security services. And this, you know, this securitization of Sunni religious activities is a function of the, the regime's very nature. Uh, i.e., you know, it's exclusive uh, nature. So I, I don't think you can really expect anything from this regime in terms of religious freedom as long as there is no, you know, comprehensive political settlement. Thank you. It's really interesting um, the, the the way that um, you distinguish the difference. And and do you see the regime going after Thomas um, religious minorities because of their religious identity? And obviously, it sounds like the Sunni Muslims they do. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of, of the Christian community, you know, there seems to be a, a, a especially harsh, um, you know, they get freedom as long as they support the regime. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's the same for, for, for everyone, which, I mean, all, all communities uh, uh, are safe as long as, of course, they're politically loyal. Uh, but I would say that, you know, regimes interference in like the internal org organization of each religious community, uh, you know, differs widely from one case to another. I would say, you know, if you take Christians, as long as they're loyal, they're more or less free to manage their own religious affairs. 
you know, the, the, the regime does not appoint top Christian clerics, right? Uh, which, uh, uh, on the contrary, they do with, with Sunnis, okay? They decide who does what at every single position. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a, a very different situation. And then, okay, I'm going, going into details about, you know, all, all, all communities, but I think there is a significant difference between the Sunni majority and everyone else in that respect for, for you know, because it's seen as an existential threat, which, you know, other minorities aren't. Understood. Thank you. D David. This is called the Millet system. As long as you were loyal to the regime and you paid a tax, you could administer your own affairs. Uh, the same holds true in many former Ottoman territories. Mm -hmm. uh, lasting reform needs to address decentralization and the rights of ethnic and religious minorities. Uh, in a profound and constitutional way so that their interests are really looked after and promoted. A window dressing won't do. The Millet system is long gone. So real control of local institutions, real self-rule for religious and ethnic minorities is the way forward in Syria and other former Ottoman territories. Thank you. Well, we're, we're running out of time. I want to give any um, of our witnesses or commissioners if they have anything else they'd like to add before we close. Just a word of thanks to you, Nadine, and to the commission for convening this important discussion. We hope it's an ongoing dialogue and that it gets decentralized to the region so we hear local voices. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I do want to say that, you know, a special thanks to the administration for really engaging with us very regularly and, and having an open door um, to discuss all of these things. And, and Capitol Hill has been the same, um, the, the, um, the different commissions and, and um, committees there have also opened their doors. So even though, you know, other things like Ukraine and, and Russia and uh, other topics, of course, sometimes take all the air in the room, there is an understanding that, that the way forward hasn't been working for Syria. And in, in part of it, as we've been saying at USURF, is religious freedom really hasn't been at the table. Um, oftentimes with these security situations, it's, it's easy to push those aside and say, we've got to deal with all these other things right now. But what happens is you end up with, as, as Deputy Assistant Secretary talked about the lasting and stable peace, you need religious freedom. And so to, to not have that be a part of it is, is actually not a way for a long-term solution. And you know, I think that is what we've tried to, to bring to the table with, with this discussion is, is um, how do we get everyone back again, but bring this component in and, and raise that part. If we're gonna find a lasting solution, then we, we've got to consider that. And we really appreciate all of you witnesses, your, your professional work, um, your scholarship on this um, has been, uh, we've all relied upon. So we appreciate your participation today and your continued work. So thank you so much. And thanks to all of our um, guests for joining today. I hope this was informative. Again, all of the testimony is on the USERF website. Um, so you can read each of their testimonies. Some of them have maps, other information that will be helpful. We appreciate you following our work. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.